Good evening everybody and welcome to another Mental Health Professionals Network webinar. Tonight we're looking at identifying body dysmorphic disorder and psychological assessments for people seeking cosmetic surgery. Um, I would like to welcome the over 500 participants that we have already who've joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who are watching the pod podcast later on down the track. Uh, we have over 2,000 registrants for tonight, so we'll see how many people actually join us live. It's great to have so many people and is a testament to another relevant topic from MHPN. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar present presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders, past, present and future for the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name is Mary Emilaeus. I'm just going to move this slide. Um, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Uh, my background is as a GP uh, and then I worked for a long time in youth mental health and now am a trainee in psychiatry. I'm based in North Queensland. Um, I'm really interested in this topic tonight um, from both the, my background in general practice and working with young people and it's also something I feel really passionately about. And it's been a privilege to meet tonight's panel, who I will be pleased to introduce to you shortly. I just want to um, acknowledge that many people have themselves had difficult experiences in their interactions with the healthcare system. Whether we're healthcare professionals or any other kind of person, we are all ourselves patients at different times. We may not have received the kind of best practice care that you're going to hear about in this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to give a broader group of health professionals the skills they need so they can help people more effectively in the future. Personal stories of illness are very important and MHPN does often include consumers and carers on our panels. However, the chat box this evening is not a forum for personal stories. It's designed to complement the panel discussion by allowing professionals to share resources and their experiences of practice. Thank you all for respecting this. And if any content in tonight's webinar does cause distress, please seek care if you need it. So you can call Lifeline or triple zero if you really need to, Beyond Blue, or contact your GP or local mental health service, or just reach out to someone who's close to you. Um, I would like to now introduce our panelists. Now their bios were sent to you beforehand, and in the interest of time, we're going to not, not go over them individually. But I'd first of all like to introduce Magda Simonis, who's a GP. Now Magda, I understand that you're in Melbourne and yes, um, you're involved in setting up a really interesting project called the Labia Library. Can you tell us how that came about? Uh, in 2013, uh, there was a, a white paper that was issued by Women's Health Victoria um, on labiaplasty and cosmetic genital surgery and uh, I attended the, uh, the forum and also contributed to the white paper um, research uh, as a GP um, and uh, we talked about how we could counter the biased representation of uh, female genitals on the internet and uh, uh, the recommendation, the suggestion was one of the suggestions I made was that we actually had something like a uh, an online library, library, which we actually all agreed to and then um, proceeded with that and it's been very successful. So it's a tool that health professionals and young women, older women, men can access for free. It's, and it is a great resource and it's really handy because you can just pull it up on your desktop when you've got a patient with you. Yeah. Um, and on the note of resources, all of the resources for tonight um, webinar are in the little resources tab down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so I'd like to now introduce Gemma Sharp. Gemma, you're a psychologist with a special interest in this area and I understand that you've actually developed a mobile app which helps people to address um, genital appearance concerns. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right Mary. So we're launching this app later this year uh, through my work at Monash University and it's basically just to address the fact that there's no real, I suppose, psychological therapies for women with genital appearance concerns, which we know are a little bit different from broader body image concerns. So with it being a mobile app, uh, women can access it from the comfort of their own home. 
with um, without any sort of shame and stigma attached to it. So we hope that it'll be really helpful for women who are experiencing these types of concerns. Thank you. And I do want to acknowledge that um, while our, our case can be based around someone having um, a, a woman with concerns about um, genital appearance, the, the whole topic of the webinar is about cosmetic surgery in general. So we, we're focusing a lot on labia because that's our case, but many of these issues apply to people with all kinds of um, uh, concerns about body image. And on that note, I'd like to invite uh, George, who is a psychiatrist from Queensland. And um, a key issue in the webinar, George, is about recognising the patient who actually has body dysmorphic disorder so from a psychiatric perspective, why is that so important? Yeah, no, thanks Mary. Body dysmorphic disorder isn't as straightforward a condition as it might appear. In fact, it's typically a surprisingly complex condition which can have quite a high level of psycho psychopathology sitting behind it. And the condition itself has a fair degree of morbidity and it can be a bit of a minefield for the unsuspecting clinician yeah, particularly those working in cosmetic surgery, um, cosmetic surgery, maxillofacial surgery, dermatology, as we'll see a bit later on. So it's a condition that we really need to have a, a pretty clear sense of and you know, the capacity to recognise it because it's one of those sleepers that can come up and bite us and cause you know, significant issues, you know, both for, of course, the patient and, and for clinicians who are trying to work with them. And George, I know you're going to be going through that in a bit more detail during the webinar, so thanks for that. It's going to be really um, important for, for all of us. Um, it's uh, great to have such an interesting and um, really expert panel. I just want to give the audience a little bit of uh, ground rules and just um, advice about how to use the platform. So the chat box that you can see in the, um, the bottom of your screen is for general chat amongst health professionals in the audience. So you may have resources or things you'd like to say. Um, we have over 700 of you online now. We'll discuss our resources towards the end of the webinar, but as I mentioned, they are in that resource box in the bottom. If you have any difficulties with technical support, please contact, uh, look at the FAQ tab for help and uh, the number for, that you can call for help is in there too. If you can't answer it just from the question. Uh, and we really value your feedback. So please, before you hang up tonight, complete the feedback survey, which is loaded under the survey tab at the top of the screen before you leave. And I'd just like to run through the ground rules as well. So again, just respectful of other participants and the panelists, and as though you would at a public meeting. Interact with each other via the chat box, um, keeping your comments on topic and notice that if you do post your technical issues in the participant chat box by accident, no one might see them. So if it's technical, make sure you go across to the technical chat box. Uh, there is a phone number there you can call if you're still having problems. And if there is a significant issue that affects everybody, you will be alerted via an announcement. So very occasionally there's some kind of technical problem. You will be looked after. Just um, wait for the instructions, just like you do on the aeroplane. Um, and just briefly, reminding of our learning outcomes. So we're going to uh, have the opportunity to evaluate when a client is required to have a psychological assessment prior to cosmetic surgery, identify the importance of collaboration when assessing a client for cos cosmetic surgery, and analyse when it's appropriate to refer a client seeking cosmetic surgery, and when there's an indication of an underlying psychological problem. So you've all um, had the case about Melanie, who's a young woman who is concerned about the appearance of her external genitalia, her labia in particular, and she's presenting to her GP to talk about um, the possibility of having cosmetic surgery. So what we're going to do is hear from each of our practitioners um, about how they would think about responding to Melody, Melanie from a discipline perspective and then um, the panellists are going to have a conversation with each other and with you. So I'd first of all like to invite Magda to respond from the perspective of the GP. Thank you. Right. Thank you Mary. Well for most general, most general practitioners uh, see patients that they've seen before and patients prefer to see a familiar GP. So 
I think that Melanie has taken a very big step in choosing to see a GP she's not met before and to take out a Medicare card on her own. Now traditionally it's the standard appointment to run for 15 minutes so it's really important that um, the staff be aware that when a teenager books an appointment that you need to really book a longer appointment to actually address the issues that might be encountered. Uh, bulk billing teenagers encourages them to attend on their own again um, and that's really what you want. You want to have an adolescent waiting, friendly waiting room and you want to encourage a, a, an environment that, that um, makes them feel welcome. Um, nearly all GPs in a research uh, um, piece that I've conducted uh, that had been interviewed had been asked about genital normality in women of all ages. And what was interesting was that of the, those GPs, 35% of them had been asked about female genital cosmetic surgery by girls under the age of 18. And statistically, uh, the incidence of labiaplasty in the 15 to 25 year old age group is equal to the labiaplasty rate of women 26 to 45. So this has raised several concerns which were um, raised uh, also by the medical board uh, in 2016 with, uh, um, and they subsequently uh, issued some recommendations about how we manage teenage. But with respect to Melanie's presentation, from a general practice perspective, it's really, really, really important that the GP listen to Melanie, let her speak, and uh, regardless of what she's expressing and how she's expressing herself, it's really important not to make her feel silly or embarrassed for attending. However minimal or it might appear to the doctor, um, it's important not to brush off her concerns as trivial. It's important for a general practitioner to use language and terms that the 15 year old will understand and try to avoid using really uh, medical terms or medicalised terms. And being patient and listening to Melanie will enable the doctor to determine the extent of Melanie's problem. But questioning um, things uh, further into, you know, uh, has she been, uh, has she had a history of eating disorders? Does she vomit? Does she help self-harm? Helps the GP sort of put it in the context of whether or not this young woman is developing or showing signs of something more uh, profound than generalised anxiety or an anxiety regarding her appearance. And, and it's important to assess how this is affecting her life and her confidence and her relationships. It's also important to understand what she knows about normality because this impact of, uh, of you know, the World Wide Web and access to internet and information, uh, you know, regarding um, uh, fashion and changing, being tight and, and, and uh, clothes being tight and pornography being accessed easily online, uh, impacts the, the decisions that people take and especially young people, they, they are impacted significantly by what they see online. That's where they get a lot of their information. So it's important to find out what she understands about genital anatomy, uh, diversity, what the function of the genital structures is, and whether or not she understands that her body is actually undergoing changes that are very normal for a young person this age. Um, it's important to also allow her to know that if it's about the length of her labia minora extending beyond the margin of the labia majora, which is primarily the concern that women present with, that 30 to 50% of women have labia minora that extend beyond the line of the labia majora. So she fits within the normal range, even though when she looks on the internet she might feel that she's abnormal. Segwaying into sensitive questioning about um, you know, her past sexual experiences and or her current sexual relationship with this boy and her readiness to have sex are important. And it is important also to um, find out whether or not there's been any sexual abuse that has not surfaced or has not been talked about. And using the third person with young people, such as some people who are concerned about you know, their appearance have had certain experiences, you know, would you, you know, has this actually occurred to you? Then it's, it's also important for the GP to find out what she knows about her boyfriend's experiences and how, it, how he's, you know, arrived to this, uh, you know, decision or perception that she's unusual. Um, a lot of uh, adults don't realise that pornography is, uh, is, uh, is accessed by teenagers and that uh, 
up to 70% of males who are younger than the age of 13 have accessed online porn, and by 15, 100% have. And porn these days is not what it was like probably 30 years ago, and certainly not online porn. So this is going to have a significant impact on the perception that, this, uh, that these young people have. The opportunity to educate young people exists in the context of the general practice uh, setting, and uh, we need to take that advantage of that opportunity. I use a simple diagram, just a sketch diagram, which is non-threatening, um, and just, or sometimes if I can't access one, I just draw one very basically and say, you know, this is the labia majora, this is this, this is that. Can you, or and or draw a diagram and then ask the patient to actually identify the structures so that you know exactly what they know about themselves or about the anatomy. And I would also offer to um, show uh, or look at some images online or use a diagram from a book um, if they felt comfortable to do that. A physical examination naturally should be offered. Um, you know, what is the problem? How, would you, you know, do you mind if we have a look and we can discuss this? Uh, if um, as a female GP uh, with a female patient, sometimes they're comfortable being alone with you and uh, you're being examined, but offer them also a chaperone such as a practice nurse. Um, and never coerce a young person or any person in fact for a physical examination. When you're conducting the examination, help her uh, talk about what it is that she doesn't like. Help her define what she dislikes. And offer Melanie a mirror. Um, and encourage her to point out what it is that she's concerned about. And this is also an opportunity to determine any degree of self-disgust or shame. Uh, and, you know, something as extreme as, you know, I hate myself, this is disgusting, I can't, you know, I don't want to look, uh, would really alert the GP to some deeper psychosocial issues. And you're thinking, you know, what's this in the spectrum of uh, anxiety? Is it anxiety? Is it bordering on body dysmorphic disorder? Where along these lines does she really fit? I always offer reassurance, choice of words, and the tone that the doctor uses really do count, not just what you say, but how you say it and the confidence with which you examine the person. If you're not confident or comfortable examining a young person, then I would strongly recommend that you actually refer them to someone that you know would be confident in doing that uh, and explain to them that you know, you'd send them to a specialist uh, 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 female uh, women's health expert or a gynaecologist, not for any reasons of uh, abnormality, but because that's really their area of specialty and not necessarily yours. So GPs do need to know their limitations. And then you would touch upon the complications of uh, female genital cosmetic surgery or labiaplasty. Doctors need to know that um, not knowing that we have to know about uh, referring patients on for counselling if they're under the age of 18 is no excuse for not doing so. So as of October 2016, GPs are expected to refer people under the age of 18 who request major uh, cosmetic surgery for counselling. And that's either with uh, a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or even another GP who is not involved with the actual surgical procedure that's being discussed or going to be performed. And there needs to be a minimum of a three month cooling off period before the actual major surgery is conducted. So counselling is mandatory. Now, um, the British and Royal uh, College of, the British College of uh, um, uh, Pediatric and Adolescent Gynaecologists, along with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, have issued recommendations regarding uh, surgery in uh, girls under the age of 18. Um, and recommend that it be delayed until after the age of 18 because genital maturity is not achieved until after 18 and that removing genital tissue before this age might result in an outcome that is unsatisfactory to the person and, uh, and uh, that the genital tissue actually continues to change and, and develop. Um, so at, uh, referring to a gynaecologist, a specialist adolescent gynaecologist is a preferred way rather than to a straight plastic surgeon. And it involves team care, the GP, the gynae, the psychologist, psychiatrist, and the parents or carers. And, uh, um, and then, you know, this is all to be achieved in a relatively uh, short consultation time 
Um, so you might need to bring the person back to have a chat again after you've actually given them some reassurance. I think from here, my, in, in this sort of uh, setting, I would then refer the patient on to a psychologist or psychiatrist to assess for, um, for uh, any mental health issues and, uh, and then also bring them back to have a chat after they've actually had that consultation. Thanks so much, Magda. It's, I, I know that I've been learning a lot through listening to that and I'm sure that the audience have been as well and we'll come back to a couple of things that you raised there in the uh, discussion together. Now uh, Gemma, I'd like to invite you to come in and talk about um, Melanie from the perspective of the psychologist. Thank you. Thanks Mary. Um, so as Magda was saying, uh, because Melanie is under the age of 18 and labiaplasty is a major procedure, she would need to be assessed by a psychologist, psychiatrist or GP who's independent of the treatment. So if Melanie was to come to me as a psychologist, I'd be very understanding first up of her concerns. It seems like she's been dismissed by her GP as well as her mother, which is really sad. But I know from my own research and also clinical practice, that there's a growing number of girls and women who are concerned about their genital appearance, just like broader body image concerns. So she's, she's not strange in this, she's certainly not alone. But what I would like to find out is first off how her particular labial concerns developed and how it's manifested since that time. I'd also like to get an understanding of how it's been impacting on her life. It seems like it's really affecting her self-esteem um, as well as her relationships. And it's also affecting her physically too. She's talked about not being able to wear a bikini and chafing in underwear. So there's both psychological and physical concerns here for her. I'd also really like to know why she wants surgery right now. Like why is it that she's come to, uh, to ask for this request now? There's probably a range of internal and external motivations. So external motivations might be potentially the influence of her boyfriend um, making that comment as well as all those psychologically driven motions, um, motivations too. I think it's also really important to ask Melanie about what she expects labiaplasty will achieve. We know that patients who have really unrealistic expectations for surgery, thinking it will revolutionise their life, are really likely to be disappointed. So it would be very important to check that she doesn't think her life will be perfect after having this because uh, it's, it's probably unlikely to be the case. It's also really important to, to bring other important people in Melanie's life in as well, particularly her mum, and get their perspective on Melanie's request for labiaplasty. And I'd also check in on whether, labia, um, whether Melanie was concerned about other body parts, not just her labia because this might be a bit of an indication of body dysmorphic disorder, which Magda's already mentioned and I know George will pick up on quite a bit more. But basically we don't want to set Melanie up to become a bit of a cosmetic surgery junkie, quote unquote, um, and, and sort of setting her up for a lifelong um, journey of getting multiple procedures. So really good to check in on that early. And um, in the resources, there's actually a specific screener for body dysmorphic disorder related to the labia. Uh, so I'd encourage people to, to use that. It's a patient reported, very quick measure that, um, that you can give to patients if you're worried about this. And finally, in terms of specific concerns, uh, I'd check on Melanie's ability to consent, considering she's under 18. I mean, in addition to all of these specific concerns that Melanie's um, put forward. I'd also, like any psychological assessment, assess her developmental history, probably involve her mum in that as well, as well as educational history, her relationship history. We've heard a little bit about her um, most recent relationship, but was there any relationships before that that we should know about? As well as a mental state examination and really importantly, a risk assessment. Because we know that people with body dysmorphic disorder are um, at high risk for taking their lives, as well as um, sometimes engaging in DIY surgery. So is Melanie thinking she might cut her own labia, like um, this is a really big concern. If she can't access surgery, might she take matters into her own hands? So it's very important to put safety measures in place 
if this is what she's thinking of doing. So while we have Melanie with us, it's a really good uh, opportunity to check her understanding and also provide her with some education, like Magda was saying. So we check, like Melanie's found labiaplasty on the internet. What does she really know about the procedure? What it involves? Does she know about the complications, both in the short term and long term? Does she know that revision surgeries can sometimes be needed? As well as the research findings, which I've um, published myself, uh, we know that while women may be happier with how their genitals look afterwards, they don't tend to experience those improvements in their self-esteem and sexual relationships that they might be expecting after surgery. So it's really important to tell Melanie that she's probably not going to have those broader life impacts even if she does have surgery. And it's also a really good chance to check in on um, Melanie, Melanie's understanding of just normal genital anatomy. She's gone through puberty and she's probably noticed that her labia has changed and so it's a good idea to tell her that that's, that's normal and that's what should happen and that there's a huge diversity in normal labial appearance but that's not necessarily shown in the media. It really only tends to be small symmetrical labia that's shown and that's probably skewed her perception of what acceptable labia minora should be. And this of course is a great opportunity to collaborate with other um, health professionals to give this education. And so we've got, we've got Melanie here and she's very concerned about her labia. And even after reassurance of normality of her labial appearance, she might still be really concerned about it. So how do we, how do we kind of help her? What, what can we offer her besides surgery? Well, her physical symptoms could be addressed through use of emollients and um, some looser fitting clothing. But I think the really hard work here has to be done by the psychologist or the psychiatrist. And um, I mentioned before about an online psychoeducational program I'm running initially for adults, but hopefully um, for younger people uh, in the future, rolled out later this year. Got my email address on there if you've got any patients who you think might be suitable for this. But basically, just using CBT principles to help address those um, unhelpful thoughts about unhelpful thoughts and behaviours about her labial appearance and um, help her live a more fulfilling life because uh, it sounds like she's having a bit of a tough time at the moment. So yeah, let's let's give her some options besides surgery that'll help alleviate her concerns right now. That's all from me. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gemma. I just want to acknowledge one of the things with um, you know MHPN is actually um, look involving lots of different therapeutic disciplines and we know that um, lots of people can do CBT as well and so and and other forms of therapy so I, I, I might actually I will come back and ask Magda so I'll just put the question on notice for later about whether the guidelines actually include other kinds of counsellors so for example if we had a social worker or a general counsellor or um, an OT who had a special interest in this area or, or knowledge or had a good therapeutic alliance with a patient who was asking about this, does that counselling meet the needs of the guidelines? So I will come back and ask that of Magda a bit later on. But right now I would really like to welcome George to come and speak to us about how he would respond and think about Melanie from the perspective of a psychiatrist. Thanks George. Thank you Mary. Okay, so what I thought I'd do here is start by walking us through how DSM-5 is, is conceptualising body dysmorphic disorder, previously known as dysmorphophobia. Now the first thing to note is that it's, it's now ranked under the obsessive compulsive disorder section of DSM-5. And as we're going to see in a moment, we're probably at the more complex end of that obsessive comp compulsive disorder spectrum. Now, DSM-5 typically organises the diagnostic criteria around, starting off with, with the first criteria A, which typically is designed to capture the essence of the diagnosis. And so when we look at, at criteria A here for BDD, we've got this preoccupation with one or more perceived defects. So Gem's already spoken to looking for you know, the possibility of other uh, perceived concerns that the patient may be presenting with. 
And so it's a, it's a perceived defect of form in the physical place that are not observable or appear slight to others. Now, the crux of this issue, particularly in this case, sit with those two words, appear slight. Now, with, George, with I'm Melanie, sorry, I, I just have to interrupt for half a second. Someone yeah. of our presenters doesn't have their phone on mute, so we just need to put that on mute so everyone can hear George properly. Please go ahead, thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, so with melanin, when we look at criteria A here, we have to remember that her lips, uh, her lower lips are large enough to cause chafing, and her boyfriend Ryan, our young budding gynaecologist here, while somewhat questionably qualified to make a judgment, we have to remember that of all the things he could have commented on with a naked 15-year-old girl beside him, he chose to comment on her labia. So at a prima facie level, they're clearly observable to others, and this would probably rule her out of a diagnosis of BDD. And while we can debate whether you know her, her, her labia may be abnormal to a greater or lesser than a slight degree, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that right now, Ryan's opinion is going to outweigh the opinion of a Nobel Prize winning gynaecologist. That's, it's going to be weighing very heavily on this young, this this very um, susceptible to other people's opinions, young girl. So that, that's the sort of opening, I, I guess, sort of position when we start to think about this. If we now drop into the remaining three criteria that DSM five offers us, so here you can see the real link with criterion B to OCD. You're looking for the a preoccupation, a high level of repetitive behaviours or mental acts, which are of course in common with with other obsessive conditions. So you've got to you've actually got to have evidence of that. Now, of course, this particular case is a little bit silent when it comes to looking for those particular symptoms. So we probably can't conjecture too much in that regard. Criterion C is a fairly um, uh, boilerplate criterion. It's looking, as it does with most conditions, at there being an observable, uh, a, a recognised degree of, of functional impairment, social occupational. And, and for this girl, my biggest concern in seeing her would be the impact that this is likely to have on her psychosexual functioning. We'll come back to that. And then criterion D looks at the overlap with eating disorders, which is you know, a very common overlap. The criterion, it's a little bit complex here because I've highlighted those words there, better explained by. So you can actually diagnose an eating disorder as comorbid with BDD, and it really comes down to a judgment as to whether which condition better explains what, you know what is in front of you. Okay, so if we now jump into the specifiers, which DSM-5 gives us for most conditions, we're looking now at, in, in many ways, the male equivalent of this. The most common presentation, uh, well, we'll come to the second one in a moment, but it is this one of muscle dysmorphobia. And this is typically where you've got young guys who just think they're not big enough, not muscular enough, and of course, this leads not just to them becoming gym junkies, but use of steroids and other problematic uh, behaviours. I thought this was rather surprising when I really uh, drilled down on this, this next one, which is really, this specifies looking at the degree of insight. So we have the first specifier, which is good or fair insight. Then you have poor insight. And then we have completely absent insight or, or indeed delusional beliefs. And it's rather impressive to find that you can have this in up to a third of these people. That's a significant percentage of this, of, of this cohort that have actually got a, a really significant level of psychopathology. <clears throat> now, if we look at the associated features of this condition, again, where the, the first one that I've, I've put in here is the delusions of reference. Again, we're looking at a degree of psychopathology that is well away now from the dimensions that we would typically see in an anxiety or depressive condition. 
we're, we're looking at something quite a bit more than that. In terms of what it's comorbid with, we've got the usual suspects there. The other interesting findings about this condition is that these, these young people often have on psychometric and, and other forms of investigation, executive dysfunctioning, where they have difficulty identifying holistic image, you know, whether it be the face or body or whatever. And they, they have this bias for focusing on detail. Similarly, if there is ambiguity in the, um, in the messages that they're getting, they have a preponderance for negatively interpreting that, that information. And I've just made a particular note here about shame. I think we can all appreciate, particularly with a case like Melanie, how shame is going to play a significant role. And it's interesting in the world of psychopathology at the moment, or particularly in the world of psychotherapy, how much we're coming to appreciate the role of shame, you know, thanks to the work of people like Brene Brown, where shame is, is really a powerful, powerful force when it comes to interfering with both the help-seeking behaviour and then the engagement in therapy uh, subsequently, so we need to um, you know, we need to recognise that these people are, are typically carrying an awful sense of shame, and we have to handle that very delicately, as both Magda and Gemma have touched on. Prevalence. I, I thought the surprising finding here was how the this is a Western world. You know, first world problem. You know, 2.4 percent in the USA, not a big gender difference. 1.8 percent in other cultures. Shobu Kyofu is is Japanese for a phobia of the deformed body. So this is a condition that seems to transcend <coughs> transcend cultures. As we've touched on. With women, we expect to find a comorbid eating disorder, not infrequently. And with men, it's typically genital concerns, although let's be honest, when we're talking about genitals, we're typically talking about penises here. Very rarely are guys concerned about the size of their testicles. Because the old joke goes, while it may be desirable to have big balls, the problem is they're going to make your penis look smaller. Let's see that as it may. What, what we've got listed next is the, uh, the clinics that we're going to find a preponderance of these people in the waiting room of. So dermatology, 9 to 15%, of course, cosmetic surgery, and then orthodontia, maxillofacial surgery. So in terms of some more context around this condition, median onset is age 15, but we typically see, see symptoms beginning as early as 12 or 13. And I thought this was a rather surprising finding that we're looking typically at six to ten years before these people first uh, you know, have their first consult. And I think that speaks to the powerful role of shame in this condition, particularly when we're talking about um, genitals as, as a challenge. Uh, of course, we want to go looking for histories of neglect and abuse because you're going to find a preponderance of that. And genetically, we're going to find more first degree relatives with OCD. If under the age of 18, there's going to be that gradual onset, often with the symptoms starting you know, in the pre teen years. And we've got to keep a, a, an eye out for suicide. Now, let's just move to the next slide where we'll pick up on that a little bit more. Psychosocial impairment is a real issue with this condition. You know, 20 percent of kids dropping out, now up to 40 percent of them becoming homebound. I mean, this is like panic disorder leading to agoraphobia. This is probably a higher number than you would typically get with panic disorder who end up being homebound. And then we've got up to, in some studies, 58 percent requiring psychiatric hospitalization. So I said at the open, this is a condition that carries significant psychopathology behind it. It's not about a preoccupation with a big nose. It's so much more that can, that can happen here. And as Gemma touched on, suicide risk is high for these kids. 29% of adolescents will attend. So something you have to be particularly vigilant for. And then for 
clinicians who might find themselves working in this space where you, you're going to have a, a preponderance of people wandering in with BVD, you've got to remember that these people respond very poorly to surgery and cosmetic procedures. And importantly, they're more likely to take legal action or, quote, become violent, unquote. That actually came up that was in DSM-5, that, that little comment about them becoming more violent than one might otherwise expect. So, therapy considerations, just quickly. Gemma has spoken to a lot of these as has Magda. Uh, I'm thinking of it here more from the perspective, if we had somebody with BDD, what are the considerations that we're going to have to look at? Um, of course, we want to keep an eye out for that, that issue of suicidality. Medications, we obviously want to treat any comorbid condition that would be responsive to medication. And remembering also uh, that OCD is a condition that can respond to SSRIs. But look, at the end of the day, this is going to be primarily a psychotherapeutic intervention. And we're going to be looking often for the underlying drivers that sit behind this, this preoccupation that the individual has. As I often find with eating disorders, we're often looking at an underlying problem that's looking for a place to land. And of course, we've got to keep a particular eye out, as I've mentioned, for abuse, but also bullying, particularly amongst teenagers. Look, I haven't got time to talk about the two theory technique at the moment, but the way that one sets up therapy with this kind of a problem. We have time, we can maybe revisit that later. And of course, typically, given the complexity of this condition and its attendant concerns, we're looking at longer term work here. And for and the teenagers, that's really a challenge of engagement. Often it's a matter of finding uh, you know, therapists who are, who are good at relating to teenagers, you know, at least psychiatrists, psychologists, because you really need to engage these kids on an ongoing basis, and that's going to require a, a, a substantial therapeutic relationship. And that's pretty much it for me. Thanks very much, George. And I just want to, um, it, it was really um, helpful to understand the complexity and the severity that can occur in body dysmorphic disorder. And um, I know that you're by no means saying that Melanie has body dysmorphic disorder, but we need to be keeping that that serious condition can be um, in the background in someone who's presenting with a case, a situation such as Melanie. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So I think I would just like to invite Gemma back in quickly. So one of the things um, that you, you'd, I, I just made that comment about um, that there are other disciplines that, that um, may be appropriate to offer counselling for Melanie and you just made a comment about your app. So I just wondered if you wanted to, um, to mention that. Sure, I suppose, um, thanks for the opportunity, Mary. My app is based on my years of research in the field and, and how to, I suppose, adapt CBT principles to address genital concerns specifically. But certainly, I would be, I would encourage anyone, any health professional uh, with CBT skills can certainly engage with this app. And um, I, yeah, I, I think it would be great to have as many health professionals as possible assisting women with genital appearance concerns. Thank you. And just a, just a reminder for everybody that the webinar topic was actually about um, both body dysmorphic disorder and counselling for cosmetic surgery. So there, there are kind of two parallel issues that are very much interwoven. And I'd like to bring Magda back in and ask you a question, Magda, um, about you mentioned the guidelines. So do you, do you happen to know whether if there was a counsellor of another discipline, not a GP, psychologist or psychiatrist, uh, and perhaps a GP referred a patient to that counsellor, would that meet the, would that be um, satisfactory to the medical board? So that was for Magda, do you know that? I'm not sure if I'm on air yet, Mary, but... Uh, yeah, you uh, are, we can Yes, I am, great. Yes, so uh, if, we, if we are to interpret the medical board guidelines and recommendations to the letter, it has to be either a general practitioner a psychologist, a psychiatrist, not affiliated with the surgeon who's conducting the surgery. However, we are quite interested in team care arrangements. So if there were, let's say, a physiotherapist with pelvic floor interest who had expertise in this particular area, uh, as they do, let's say, with you know pelvic floor uh, exercises and uh, incontinence in some cases, they may well also be in a position where they could actually advise a patient who's concerned 
but would that actually constitute an appropriate referral for counselling? If we're to observe the letter of the medical board, no, it would need to be a GP, psychologist or psychiatrist. Thank you. And um, I also wanted to ask you about, um, we know that it's a requirement if somebody's under 18, but how do you make the decision about adult clients? How do you decide if you need to make that referral for them as well? In, with respect to adults, who are, who you, if you are um, uh, concerned about their uh, psychological state, then you should re, uh, refer them for further assessment uh, to a professional who could actually diagnose them. Um, however, it's not mandatory. It's really up to the surgeon themselves then to actually determine the fitness of that particular individual to consent to the procedure and that they have a full understanding of the implications and potential consequences of surgery. So it, it is important for the GP to actually make an assessment and if the GP has a high level of concern regarding the level of anxiety uh, or any uh, suggestion or suspicion of body dysmorphic disorder, then they should really include that in their uh, referral to either the surgeon and or recommend the person see a therapist before they proceed to surgery. So it's not a mandatory requirement that they actually see a psychologist first. And I, I'm guessing in that situation, certainly if you had a, a, a therapist with which that patient, with whom that patient had a good therapeutic alliance, that would be perfectly appropriate if they had some expertise in the area. So if they were seeing a social worker, an OT, a mental health nurse, a general counsellor, yeah. that is a good therapeutic relationship in which to talk about those intimate, kind of potentially shame-based concerns. Exactly. And with major surgery then, with adults, they all, all they require really is a seven-day cooling off period. So um, for major surgery, whereas for you, an, a minor under the age of 18, they need to have a three-month uh, cooling off okay. period before any major surgery. And, George raised a really good question when we were preparing for the webinar. Why is labioplasty classed as major surgery? Major surgery is considered anything that involves cutting through the full thickness of the skin. Okay. Which includes so it's a, it's anything... A kind of technical it, definition. It's a technical definition and it also includes things like liposuction and rhinoplasty. Yeah. And also he also asked the question about what are the complications? Complications of labiaplasty are as with any surgical procedure. So there's uh, the, the you know the immediate potential uh, complications of infection, hemorrhage, uh, dehiscence of the wound, which is breakdown of the of the suture line. There are other complications that can arise because, of course, the labia minora, if if it is a labia minora that are actually cut, um, they they are um, they are enriched with a very rich supply of nerve fibres and blood vessels and sometimes in the healing process the nerve fibres can actually form nodules which are called neuromas and they can be very, very painful. Sometimes also the, there is too much of the labial tissue is removed and it exposes the clitoral hood which means that the clitoris is constantly exposed to undergarments and uh, patients can experience chronic pain as a consequence of their clitoris rather than going to their clothes. Um, there can be obviously um, change in colour, there can be irregularity of the scar line along with the nodularity and dysesthesia or constant pain. So altered sensation, reduced sensation or constant pain. They are, they are complications and the complication rate is anything up to, well, it, there, there's only one real study that has been conducted out of the, you know, uh, New South Wales which indicates that Complication rates are anywhere from 18 to 14, 8 to 14 percent, uh, which is a significant um, uh, complication rate. Whereas Thanks. when you look online yeah. at surgeons, for instance, who, who perform the surgery, they tend to uh, um, understate the complication rate, and they say, you know, that they have 98 percent satisfaction, satisfied patients. Thank you. It's really important for us to get that accurate information, and um. George, I think that I saw your questions there. Yeah. I wanted to bring, apologise for that, I wanted to bring you back in with another one. So we've had a question from the... Actually, look, um, before, we, before we go on... Yeah, go on. Can I, can I just say that when Magda 
ran through what she just um, shared with us there, you know, when we were having a chat about this last week. I was really quite stunned at how, you know, these aren't minor potential complications that we're talking about here. You know, these, these are complications that could affect, you know, a, a woman's sexual functioning for, for years, if not, you know, for long. So I don't know how you go about correcting some of those problems when they occur. And it was, yeah, it was really an eye opener to me that this is, you know, this isn't just about cutting away from excess skin, not by a long shot. Yeah, I found myself sitting listening to it with it, with sadness on my face, to be honest. I, mm. Anyway, um, so George, I wanted to ask you from the um, audience about whether there's any, do you know of any um, psychometric sort of screening tools for body dysmorphic disorder around any, um, not just around labioplasty, but j just so that um, uh, um, like more generalist colleagues can have a way of identifying it? Look, I must must admit I don't live in the world of psychometric testing as much as Gemma does. So maybe I could handle that one off to Gemma. I think that's a great idea. Gemma, can you answer to that one? Sure. Yeah, there's actually um, quite a few uh, patient self-report uh, psychometric questionnaires that people can give to patients in the waiting room, which are really uh, short, sharp and shiny. There's the um, cosmetic procedure screening scale. So the, the labiaplasty version of this is in the resources, but there is also the generic version as well. Um, there's the body dysmorphic disorder questionnaire, BDDQ, again, freely available online, just Google it, um, as well as the more structured interviews like uh, from the mini. Um, so yeah, there's definitely uh, screeners out there, both for patients and then structured clinical interviews too. Thanks, that's really helpful. And I, I know that there was, I, I will invite you to just add to what um, Magda was talking around, around complications. There was something to keep oh, in relation to the clitoris. Sure, yeah, like um, as Magda was saying, the clitoris can definitely become exposed in labiaplasty. And so what often happens is labiaplasty is done together with um, a clitoral hood reduction um, because it can make the, the labia look really unbalanced. Um, so that's a main reason for people going back for labiaplasty revisions, that the clitoris actually ends up looking like a micro penis, um, and people are just really, really upset with that outcome. So sometimes labiaplasty is offered together with the clitoral hood reduction to avoid that situation, but it can certainly look very, very odd down there after labiaplasty. Yes, it's quite um, confronting, isn't it? And I think it's just, it's so refreshing to be able to have a conversation of this nature in such a public forum where people can really ask questions. Um, Magda, I know you've got something else to add around that. Yes, well, what's interesting is that uh, in many cases, women are not aware that the clitoral hood is actually trimmed along with the labia minora when they're actually having their labia minora so-called trimmed. And uh, it is really uh, the surgeon who actually makes an aesthetic call at the time of the procedure. And uh, that can result in an outcome that the woman didn't actually initially agree to. But they don't really fully understand the implications of this um, until they have say, some, some complications or if they're unhappy with the physical appearance. Now, interestingly, online in America, there is a website which is called uh, www.botchedlabiaplasty. And uh, the fellow who actually uh, performs the uh, labiaplasty revisions is a fellow called Gary Alter, who actually has performed the largest number of labiaplasties in the world. And he's actually the one that's written perhaps a lot of the papers on uh, you know, wedge resection of the, of the labia minora, and he's developed various techniques for this. And he openly states that uh, the up to 50% of the labiaplasties that he sees have actually not been performed by people who have adequate training. And that is one very important consideration when a referral is made for this, and when me women are making decisions around this, that there are no formal qualifications required to perform this surgery and that anyone who has a medical degree can actually conduct this surgery with minimal training. And I noticed that you did also specify earlier that if someone is having, um, 
you know, if it, for example, in Melanie's case, it, it may be a decision that she does go ahead with labioplasty if they are significantly a problem for her and that's what her, you know, everybody agrees is the right thing. You did comment about um, going to a specialist gynecologist um, rather than a general cosmetic surgeon. Uh, and I guess that's along the lines of what you're saying. Mm. Well, certainly for adolescents, the specialist paediatric and adolescent gynecologist is the way to go for the opinion regarding surgery, whether or not it's warranted. And there are rare cases where that is warranted. Uh, and mm. it is really up to that particular um, surgeon to make that call along yeah. with the parent and the, and the child. Great, thank you. And I, I realise we're we're doing talking a lot of sort of technical medical things, but I actually think this is often the stuff that as generalists we're not aware of. It's very helpful. And I guess a little along those lines, I would like to invite George back just to talk about like how, how do we if if someone is making a decision of of any age, let's say it's an adult, um, how do we know that they're actually giving informed consent? How do you determine that they have capacity to give informed consent? They're two separate questions, I guess. Yeah, I guess we can we can think about it in terms of looking at capacity, as you might for testamentary capacity. You're obviously looking to make sure you know, their cognitive abilities are intact, that they have the intellectual wherewithal to be able to make an evaluation of the option. And and when when you're talking to people, you want to ask them about you know how well do they understand the potential outcomes, of course not the positive ones so much as particularly the negative ones. How What's their capacity to sort of weigh these things up in, in making a decision? But you know, I, I do quite a lot of this kind of work in a different space. I, I work uh, with people who have fertility problems and I'm, I'm doing, I look after the sort of counselling end of that. And one of the things I've learned over the decades of doing this kind of work is that the simplest thing to do often is to spend time with these people. You don't have to spend a lot of time, but you want to spread out the assessments over time. Because often people move into a, a, a mental position around these things. They can put a lot of ego behind. And it's all being driven by something which they may or may not even, not even be able to help you get in touch with. But if you if you say okay, well look, you know, you go through all this, you take a detailed history, you look at other considerations, you know, other conditions that might need to be considered. I find the simplest and most powerful thing to do is to get them back, and get them back not you know a week later or two weeks later, but about three weeks later, maybe four weeks later. And if if the if the you know if if, if everybody will allow this to happen, again another three or four weeks later. And I just find that most of the time. It just falls out. It becomes quite evident, you know, if after, you know, eight, eight weeks of, of them seeing different professionals and yourself and they come back and they're still really committed to it and they seem to have a, a balanced view of it, then you're going to be much more comfortable about, you know, recommending they go ahead, and, you know. But if, you know, six weeks later they often have moved on and things that were issues for them just aren't. So as I was thinking about this, I think one of the simplest and most profound things to do is just to see these people over time. I love to see medical legal assessments. You know, it can be very efficient to see somebody you know, twice in a week or this week and next week. It's much more informative to see them this week and again in three weeks' time because cross-sectionally people are going through whatever they're going through at that point in time. And you really want to just allow time to help you out here. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'm also imagining that since since you raised the issue of shame, I would think that having someone who's listened empathically, not judged them, and created a space where they feel safe to talk about it, for some people that actually takes the um, energy out of the issue. And so over time, you might see that it's it's not such a distressing thing anymore. That that's a really important point, Mary. You know. This is, shame is something that we're, I think, really finally recognizing its power, as I, as I touched on before. But equally, when somebody comes along and talks to a professional, they often expect to be judged by us. And I think, you know, hopefully as a profession, you know, when I say us, I mean all of the um, healthcare professions. And, you know, we're all trained to be non-judgmental. Um, 
but it's very important to make sure that they see that to, to almost you know not overplay it but but make it really clear that you know yeah you don't really see this as anything to be ashamed about at all and when you do that when you it is really surprising how when you see them the next time they have shifted and they've shifted because of the way in which you responded to them you know in, in other settings i bring people in who have been sexually abused and put them into group therapy and i can tell you that one of the most powerful things that happens in group therapy is just that they share this incredibly shameful secret with other people who aren't clinicians even better and who don't judge them and just continue to relate to them as though they're normal human beings after revealing their deepest darkest yeah. secret it's incredibly powerful and you're right just just yeah. just letting them sit and then bring them back and see where they are you know three weeks later that's really really helpful and i i wanted to um bring magda back in because the, i mean the other thing that helps us create a space where um without shame is also just accurate information so we've had a question from the audience around where would where would you find an expert surgeon who you can trust who's not just trying to promote their um their product so magda how do we find such a person um and there was another another thing that you raised there about this that i mean i certainly as a gp was not aware of all the complications that you raised so i guess the two questions um, well, I guess they relate to where do we find a surgeon we can trust? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. And very often what people will do is they will actually seek uh, information for that online. And what they'll find is that there's a host of surgeons who promote themselves as having some outstanding results and, uh, and aesthetic outcomes. The difficulty with that, however, is that they actually market themselves as um, well, they, they, see, they see patients or they see women as consumers and not as patients. And, uh, and women will often come to their GP having made um, some, you know, re having conducted this sort of research online. Uh, and they will actually come to the GP and say, look, you know, I'm considering having this done. What do you think? Now, GPs may or may not be equipped to advise the person regarding the qualifications or the quality of surgery that they're going to have with this particular individual. What we do within our own circles as GPs is we talk to one another and we talk to other specialists and we would actually sometimes pick up the phone and speak to someone that we trust and get their opinion on this. Uh, one might opt to go for a gynaecologist who they know has expertise in the field rather than a plastic surgeon. So, you know, there are gynaecologists who perform the procedure, there are urogynaecologists who perform the procedure, and there is, a, there is a range outside of the cosmetic surgeons that uh, a GP will actually talk to the patient about. Um, a really good tool that's available for doctors is the RAGP, RAG, CGP guide for health professionals on FGCS, which is easily, you know, easy to download. And it talks about the complications because often patients will say, look, you know, what do you think of this? Do you think that this is a good idea? I'm unhappy. Um, and, uh, and the list of complications are, uh, are included in that guide. But it has sort of caught GPs unawares because it's a relatively new phenomenon. So 20 years ago in, you know, practicing in women's health, these were not discussions I had with patients. And women all had pubic hair, and now they don't mostly, and uh, especially the younger women. So you know this exposure of genital tissue to women who've actually never really had a full education regarding genital anatomy from childhood all the way through to adulthood, um, then see this other part of themselves as new, different, and now are being told is abnormal. So there's been a, a, a surge of interest in this. So if caught. GPs unaware just as it has caught women um, in this sort of whole marketing, uh, you know, um, marketing thing uh, that, that promotes a particular look. Yeah. Mm. So no, that's really, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that is one of the things about um, having much less pubic hair around is that you actually are much more likely to see people's labia, whereas in the past they were more hidden. Although women tend to um, probably not get so much exposure to each other's genitals as boys do growing up. Yeah. Gemma, I, I'd like to bring Gemma back in. 
So George talked about the um, power of group in reducing shame. And I actually wondered whether you're aware of any um, online groups or forums for women who have these concerns. Sure, Mary. There, there aren't heaps of groups as you might expect with this, I suppose, really sensitive issue of labial appearance concern, but there certainly are some. There's the Large Labia Project um, where women can actually upload pictures of their labia and, and ask if it, it you know, looks okay and uh, you know, it's a very, very much a, a body positive block. So um, they're not going to be shamed in any way. In fact, um, labial appearance is celebrated on the Large Labia Project. There's also for a bit of a younger audience the Scala Teen, um, which is like I suppose sex ed um, in the real world and there's some uh, message boards there that people can post questions on and, and get advice. So there are forums out there, just not a huge number just yet. And Gemma, we, you know, the webinar is also about um, body dysmorphic disorder in general. Do you know if there are such, kind, such forums for other types of body concerns? That's absolutely. There's um, like there's Endangered Bodies, um, which is a really excellent positive body image um, site. So I think in terms of more general body image concerns, there's actually more support out there online um, for people to access. Thank you. Now I can't believe that we're nearly finished already. So Gemma, I'm just going to put you a notice. I'm going to come back to you in a couple of minutes to give us some. Um, final messages. I'd first of all, I'd like to invite George back in. So just um, in, a, in about one or two minutes, is there a couple of key messages that you would like to leave us with? And I know everyone is going to be inspired to go and look up a lot of this stuff, but what would you like us to take away from tonight, George? Yeah, I was going to uh, obviously highlight the importance of, of being vigilant for body dysmorphic disorder and knowing what to look for in terms of diagnosing it. And I think probably people you know, get that. But it was the question before that you asked me, Mary, about uh, you know, the, the actual evaluative process. I, I think the take home that I would like to offer people is, which I, hadn't, I just hadn't thought about until you asked me, was just the power of using time to assess somebody you know, over a period, you know, I, I think, Ideally, at least three um, three sessions to really allow you know clarity as to where this person is at in relation to their concerns about their condition and their desire for, I guess in this case, surgery. Yeah, I, I think I, it really time is such a uh, a simple maneuver that we can bring to bear on this very, very potentially complex condition. And it's really helpful. One thing I haven't mentioned tonight is we always have so many rural and remote practitioners on as well and um, those practical tips that apply to all of us are just invaluable. So thank you yeah, so much. Yes, I, I have a lot of sympathy for, um, for our friends and, and colleagues in, in, in regional and rural Australia. I spent a bit of time out there myself and and so often we can talk about the clever, you know, the people we, we refer to, and and I know that for these, you know, these guys and girls, that they don't have anybody to refer to in any, you know, um, in, in anything approaching the abundance that we have in in metropolitan areas. So yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can think of other practical tips for future <laughs> webinars. And I mean, the resources are invaluable as well down in there. In yeah, the that's in the right. Corner. Um, so I'd like to now invite Magda just to give us a couple of final comments. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Well, actually in agreement with what George said, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, really teenagers need longer consultations. That's a really important thing. Um, and it's really important that we listen and let them speak for at least the first three minutes to hear exactly what the range of their issues are and and uh, is and and the consultation is actually an opportunity to educate the person and uh, and uh, really talk about diversity and the range of normality. So um, it's uh, the GP is in a really prime position to provide education to refer to sites that can actually um, inform the person better and. And also the GP 
has to make an assessment of whether or not this is uh, sort of a, an abnormal, uh, a sort of an abnormal degree of concern, or a mild range of anxiety about you know, that results from just ignorance, or whether or not it's actually bordering on some deeper psychosocial mental health issues that need to be explored further, and that of course requires another visit or a referral. And examination is also a key part of the consultation with the doctor. So you know we we have we have it all really. Um, we we you have to do the screening, we have to do the listening, the assessment, and we also have to do the physical examination. And with that, then offer the appropriate recommendations. So yes, for the physical symptoms and signs, yes. Um, but it is about engaging a team. So with a young person, it's about involving parents. It's about looking at their history. It's about exposing risk that they're actually facing in their lives and education. Thank you so much. And I guess um, with that with that power comes a lot of responsibility and I, I, I'm sure that, um, well, I know that often young people are, um, can be actually wounded and harmed by things that GPs have said when they didn't understand something properly or didn't know enough. So I think you're... Um, your thoughts about knowing your scope of practice, downloading the guidelines, becoming familiar with this, and the fact acknowledging that GPs have been a bit taken on the hop by this. And I also was thinking what you said just then was also really valuable for any aspect of cosmetic surgery, that um, you know to 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 listen to people's concerns, examine them, give them accurate information. So all of that's really helpful, not only for labioplasty but for anyone seeking cosmetic surgery. Thank you so much, Magda. And then um, last but definitely not least, I'd like to invite Gemma back in to just give us your final comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. So yeah, I agree with Magda, um, definitely giving people the facts and um, reassuring them that they are, uh, that their anatomy is normal. But I think we all know that we can have concerns with normal anatomy. I don't really like my nose, for example, but I know it's in the normal range. Um, so yeah, what do we what do we do to help people who still have a concern even though they know they're normal? And that's where we do need to dig a bit deeper and um, give them some other strategies besides cosmetic surgery, uh, because cosmetic surgery is pretty much all about performing on normal anatomy and and improving it. So I think um, that's where we all need to um, really understand the roots of people's concerns and design therapy, whoever delivers it appropriately, to address. The, where the where the appearance concern came from in the first place. Thank you very much. And I would really like to acknowledge the research that both you and Magda have done in this area and the contribution it's making to um, the care of our patients in Australia across the discipline. So I just want to acknowledge that. And it's really actually hard to end this webinar because it's been so informative and engaging. But I do have to do that. So. I will please invite everybody to complete the survey feedback before you go. Uh, there's a tab at the top of your screen that you can open to complete that and it does inform the MHPN's development of further webinars. You will be emailed a certificate of attendance for the webinar within four weeks and you'll also be emailed a link to the online resources associated with the webinar in two weeks and you are um, of course able to access MHPN webinars in the library uh, retrospectively and there's a great library of things there. We encourage you to join an MHPN network in your local area so remember that there are also face-to-face -face networks and you can see the link there to find out what's in your area. In fact if you want to start one you can contact MHPN uh, and for more information about them please go to that website uh, and I just want to thank over 800 people for staying online with us tonight and thank you for everyone's contribution and participation. Good night.